Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. All righty, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It's evening here. Oh, welcome to the show, Conversations with Karalia. We are into our next episode, this time with Stephen Blaze, otherwise known as DJ Blaze or just Blaze. Uh, so excited. I've been kind of bugging Blaze for the last three or four months to get him on the show. Um, I met him last July at a party where he was co-facilitating an embodied ecstatic dance with Sasha Hope. And I loved his vibe, loved his vibe, loved his energy and loved the music that he played. And the way as a dancer, I just felt so held on the dance floor. And I have since done a lot of parties where Blaze has played and a lot of transformational festivals where Blaze has played. And I don't always like the genre of music like I have, you know, but what I notice is what he brings is amazing. And he always, always DJs for the dancer, right? And I, as a dancer, I'm so attuned to that. Like I really notice the DJs that are working for the dancers compared to DJs that might be working for accolades or what's cool or what, what sounds really good. Because sometimes what sounds really good is not always what's really best for the dancers. Um, interesting thing about Blaze is that he used to work in the garment textile industry, in the clothing industry. So we talk a bit about that on this show. Uh, what else can I tell you about Blaze? Maybe I don't need to say anything else. I'll, you know what, I'll tell you a little bit about his bio, you know, because it's always good to do these things. And I like what this says. Uh, this is from ecstaticdance.org. An alchemist of frequency. Blaze likes to take listeners on a connective experience through the body with deep bass lines and eclectic melodies, allowing dancers to venture deep into the experience, but always brings them home. Pretty much sums it up. All right, let's dive into the conversation. Uh, you may notice that the, the colors might change here because the recording I did of the introduction before our interview didn't work. So now the light has changed and I'm doing it again, but it don't matter. It's all good. As always, stay tuned to the very end when I'll reflect on the conversation that we have just had. All righty, Blaze, welcome to the show. Kia ora, thank you for having me. Uh, where in the world are you right now? Right now, I am in Auckland uh, at my place, which is in Torbay, kind of Albany area. It's a 70s mansion in Auckland, New Zealand, that's about to be destroyed in about a month. Yeah, it's a cool <laughs> house. I can vouch for that. We're going to miss that house. Um, yeah. Okay, so there's an, a second question I'm going to start asking all my guests. Feel free to answer in as much depth or as briefly as you like. What's your worldview? What's the lens with which you perceive reality? <laughs> that's a huge question um okay what lens do i see it yeah it's your world view hmm. well there's like oh immediately my brain goes to a few different like experiences that i would probably try to convey but if i was true i would say that we are like some sort of energetic being having a 3d human experience on a planet that seems to be in a its own reality where everything is of the same principles Ooh, i like that i like that <laughs> energetic beings on a planet where everything is of the same principles epo now mm. those are some of your creations that we can see hanging on the rack behind you oh uh, yeah these are my like this is the last like kind of uh, fur coats that i've made that will ever look like that because i'm kind of like Next design is ready. So these are like them. Oh, so you're not going to be making any more of those. They're like so epic. Like when you and Jody walk through a festival wearing those, I'm like, 
there go the rock stars. They just have such a vibe. <laughs> it's so extravagant, isn't it? But that's it. So they, extravagant. They, yeah, I know. But actually, the the real cool thing about these coats is like when you the way you feel when you feel uh, when you wear them. It's not about like how like puffy and soft you look. It's like it's kind of like a giant hug. So that when you're like in your attire and then you have this coat on, you're just like oh like it doesn't really matter what the environment is doing you can still have like warmth and yeah <laughs> I love it I love it so tell yeah, me yeah. about like because I met you obviously as a DJ um, and a yoga mm -hmm. teacher but you've had a career already in the fashion industry yeah yeah I've, can you um, give, tell us about it most of my 20s yeah was in the fashion industry I kind of lived a couple different lives at once i so i started selling suits and as a retail job to get through university and um mainly because there was a target right i worked at a, a stop that had like targets and i realized like quite early i was like oh i like these suits and they're real expensive so if i sell like <laughs> two, suit, two suits and a shift i make the target and then i can actually just like do what i want um and and it developed into like a loving of dressing nice because it was like men's tailoring um and then i went off and did corporate stuff for a little while was like a assistant buyer for a technology company i studied oh fine but oh my goodness to, <laughs> went into <laughs> clothing and then I love um, it. yeah and then an old boss that i had at a retail job reached out to me and was like there's a there's a um factory in mount eden that's like a sportswear factory and there's no like no one to take it over and so we me and him his name's jeremy we took that like bought the machines and sort of just gave the two staff that were there like a job and and, and tried to like start a clothing label where we like just manufacture stuff locally for the love of it yeah. wow so you went yeah. right i didn't even realize that so you went straight in and kind of the deep end of like buying a business like starting up a business in the garment world <laughs> yeah well yeah we started a business in like an industry that is literally dying <laughs> like <laughs> like to, to to manufacture clothing in New Zealand is like comparatively very expensive because of the labor wage compared to like buying something from in the thousands from overseas so it's like a super niche. We were like selling Lamborghinis, but it's clothes. But, you know, like we're selling mm. clothing that's made by hand in Auckland. And you can just order 10 if you want. We don't care because we're making every single one of them like individually. Um, and so therefore we kind of niched ourselves into high-end women's wear. Mm -hmm. So there's like local designers around Auckland that, um, yeah, you know, the likes of Trillius Cooper can spend, you know, a customer will spend like 1300 on a dress so that they can afford to pay a small company like myself or a few others that exist, like a, an average, an okay amount, like $300 to make it because they can mm. sell it for 13 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the margins on clothing are crazy. Like we go into the shops like, oh, look, a T-shirt for $10. But I don't think very many people stop to go, well, hey, hang on a second how on earth do you source the material sew the thing design the thing ship the thing market like for ten dollars right you can't even buy the fabric for ten dollars in new zealand like for a t-shirt you need 70 centimeters around on average you know and so like cotton nice cotton is like 20 bucks a meter so it's like the, <laughs> the fabric is like you know and if you know, that's if you're buying small amounts like if you're buying a thousand if you're buying like a whole piece which is like a roll it's cheaper because they the machine like i can go into this even deeper but like the other part of my life was i also sold high like men's tailoring suit fabric for a company in england and used to travel around the world to like sell this fabric to tailor like the most famous tailors in the world it was crazy anyway they what I also learned about through that industry is how clothing like fabric is created. So I simultaneously mm. how fabric is created and how clothing is created. And so it was like really vertical. And so basically if you're like, 
a machine it requires like all these cottons to be like hand woven into these like pieces and then like the machine can just run for 12 hours straight and just chew out a roll of fabric but if there's like one of those needles like loses its thing loses its like pit thread the whole machine will stop someone comes and like untie ties that thread back on my hand and then the machine starts cranking again like so it's cheaper to just have a whole roll then that's how like overseas yeah. companies make it so cheap they buy like ten thousand pieces you know because it's like zara and they need to make ten thousand of that garment mm. yeah so now you're, you're doing um the bespoke bohemian so basically i guess that what that means if i come to you and say hey i would love this piece of clothing you'll design it and make it and charge what's actually appropriate for that level of work i'm guessing it yeah, be, yeah. yeah and how do you find um, that people are surprised at what it actually costs to create a garment yeah i would there's that but it's also i guess that they don't recognize the time that's involved and that's mm -hmm. you know a lot actually it's just that, that you know when you do every single piece of it yourself it takes like quite a long time but you know we are conditioned into not considering the labor cost of clothing when we buy it so it doesn't make sense so like for me it's like you're just you're actually paying for me to make you the thing that you desire instead of doing what I want to do so it's just like you have a labor wage you know yeah. um and, and like so how many hours my... how many hours would it take to to make one of those coats because they're fully lined aren't they and they've got like pockets on the inside and yeah I know yeah, sure. I've been watching your Instagram <laughs> <laughs> they're like yeah they're just like engineered to, to a specific brief so uh, like the last one that i made and like keep in mind i'm not a professional machinist like and what i mean by that is i don't spend the majority of my time sewing so like my skill is not sewing so i'm not like the fastest measure of how long it would take but like the last coat i took i made took 32 hours oh. because yeah, I, I I by choice added all this stuff because the customer wanted it to have like a first sleeve but with a cuff and also like a hood and but he also like he, there was heaps of aspects he liked of the current but wanted it a different and so it's like if you're sewing a lining with a fur like a layer of fur and then like another two layers of fur for the like it's just like a mission so I just was like fuck that I'm just going to make like cuffs that come on and off so it's just way easier and uh -huh. then i made like a detachable hood that like clips in and like because it's like the way it's made you just can't see it if it doesn't so like i had to like figure out how to do that shit. <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> yeah how, how did you go from then the garment industry because i've seen some photos actually of you you were a sharp juicer in those suits and i know you still do that every now and then yeah. Um, but how did you go from there to kind of the yoga transformational festival DJ scene where people aren't necessarily renowned for the suits they wear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a wide, it's a, a different world, eh? Um, yeah. I basically just didn't like the industry. Like clothing is a way that I've always expressed myself um, and always will and like creating clothing is really fun like satisfying a need that someone has is like a fun thing to do in terms of like the, what i do with these things is i don't just make coats like i'm just making the thing that you want that you can never find you know everyone has a thing they're like oh i had an ex-partner when i was like 22 and she just had like a tiny ass waist and she just worked out heaps so she had a booty so she just like could not buy jeans that were like high waisted but still fit her waist back go around you know like and i was like well make them and then it kind of eventuated and then it got into the festival scenes and then went into like crazy stuff um but i got to that because i still like making clothing but i just realized that it's like not a very good way to make a living because it's like not not good it's just like you know there's a ceiling there's a ceiling that you can't yeah. really yeah so i was like well fuck that then you know like <laughs> i'm just gonna keep doing it for fun and you know so i still make clothes i don't have a i don't particularly advertise it i just do it from now and now and then yeah yeah when people find you so how did you end yeah. up because you're a trained yoga teacher right 
You did your yoga teacher training? I have done a teacher training and I've done like various types of embodiment workshops. So I wouldn't call myself a yoga teacher, but I do, I am like, I do yoga all the time. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And you, you, you have taught sometimes though, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm you... more of an aesthetic dance facilitator, somatic yeah. dance as well. So yeah. How did you find your uh, way into the somatic dance? Was that via DJing or how did you find your way to yeah, DJ? I... I just happened to like do a stint at, on the, in the first lockdown with the guy who invented Serato. His name's AJ, and Serato is like a software for DJs. So yeah. there's just heaps of cool like memorabilia about the music industry, and he had this like gold plated DJ deck, and I just like it was so I was just like that's so nice. Like it just enticed me one lockdown. And so I just had, I had a go at DJing and whatever. And then sort of after the whole, that shenanigan, I went to a, a conscious festival called Spirit Festival. And I went to an ecstatic dance at there. And it was just like, what is right. happening right now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was your and first so was, ever ecstatic dance. Yeah. Spirit, yeah. It was a yeah, yeah, it was. Um, was it DJ it was Namaste out, or was yeah. it? And and uh, yeah, and um, I remember that forest. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We would have been on the same dance floor at the same time, but not knowing yeah. each other. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of my community that I recognize from that dance floor. You know, like it was just like something happened there in me that I was just like, whoa, there's something else going on, and and. The, <laughs> 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 right it was the middle of the day that one yeah it was a beautiful yeah. sunny sunny day yeah something yeah, else going on literally and then <laughs> and then uh i just yeah ended followed some breadcrumbs and ended up at a training with a woman called sasha and just yeah. like i thought i was coming for a dance training ended up going for this like <laughs> roller coaster emotional deep dive into my body and came out the other side just like, whoa, I just have never driven my human like properly before. I love that that line. I have just never really driven my human properly before. <laughs> you know, that was kind of the experience that I had. And I was just yeah. like, whoa. And then from there, I was like, cool, well, I need to investigate this further. So I decided to do did a yoga teacher training with her and embodied flow. And just literally three weeks ago finished this co-facilitating with Sasha a, a somatic dance training which was 11 days and so that's like the first one that I've kind of really held this whole space yeah. I've been an assistant and um, things like that but it's been a pretty yeah. quick quick journey then because lockdown we're talking 2020 it's like you know three years ago that yeah. you discovered the DJ decks and then Tanglewood ecstatic dance and then boom, 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 here you are co-facilitating with Sasha and DJing yeah, up and down the country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty bizarre to be honest. Like it's yeah. just like, oh, cool, this is what I'm doing now. Okay. <laughs> you know? Um, I, love you... It. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it... like, I didn't, sorry. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like, I didn't, I wasn't just like, whoa, th I'm going to like, that's what I'm going to do. I was more just like, oh, cool. I like, started exploring and, and then it is, went, whoosh, oh, that's right. That thing and that thing and that thing all perfectly merge into this thing. And yeah, so it's just been like a, a happening, which has been quite interesting. Mm, yeah. So that first ecstatic um, training that you went on, ecstatic embodied, mm -hmm. embodied ecstatic dance training, you said yeah. you went into quite an emotional deep dive, et cetera. How many men were on that particular training and, and how was that as a man going into the emotional stuff? Yeah, there was three of us, I believe, uh, with 20 total, so 17 okay. women. Um, I think that's what it was. That was a few years ago now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a yeah, it was a massive experience actually because I did it with my partner at the time as well. So there was like quite a lot of dynamics going on. I'm like discovering depths of emotion, depths of like holding, 
dips of like you know releasing things that are holding me back and just ways of that I show up in the world and so there's like it was just like a lot yeah <laughs> Did- yeah um so just about like yeah what I realized um to come to the second part of your question was it was uncommon it was bizarre that I was there yeah everyone was just like like yeah I guess like a just like a man that sees them yeah yeah I would say that was probably the very first thing that stood out about you to me was that I felt seen in a way that I don't often feel seen by men necessarily. It was Mm. really palpable. Um, So it makes sense that you're now co-facilitating that kind of work. (laughs) (laughs) Does it though? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not like, yes and no way. I know what you you mean. Yeah. I wouldn't consider myself a teacher, but I, I often find myself in places like that. So, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's curious, right? Because is there a difference between being a facilitator or a space holder that's sharing and being a teacher? Because I'd say there's quite a lot of teachers that are not necessarily good at facilitating or holding space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see yeah. what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it certainly feels like it's needed. Yeah, for sure. Mm. So one of the things that you and I have talked about over the last year, we've kind of touched on it a few times, is what it feels to be a man in the conscious yoga, wellness, transformational space when there's been, it's kind of died down a bit now, but there felt like there was a period there where all these men were getting called out for their, you know, manipulative, coercive, controlling, abusive behavior. Mm. Um, yeah, how did that feel for you when all that was going on? Did you feel like people were, I don't know, looking at you or did you feel like you had to be really careful of your behavior or yeah, what, what was it like? What is it like? Yeah. Um, I know what you're referring to. It was, it was pretty intense actually, like for multiple reasons, like there was definitely like a requirement for like an evolvement of the masculine cry from the feminine is what I felt, but there was also like lots of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And like, there was a moment there where I was like, Oh, I better like, I just better not step out of line for a minute. Like <laughs> That was kind of like, not that I intend to, but I was kind of just like, Whoa, there's like, there's like a cry for the masculine to be better. Yeah. Mm. And that's cool and and required and has unfolded the way it does. Mm. Um, So I definitely felt that. Um, Yeah, there's, I mean, I definitely have the privilege of being a tall white male, you know, it's quite, um, important how we walk walk through life it's mm. a privilege to have. Mm. Mm. so as yeah as someone who's up the front of the room like when you're DJing obviously you're at the front of the room and when you're co-facilitating the ecstatic dance you're at you're at the front of the room and you're in spaces sometimes like where there's not that many men do you mm. find do you do you feel women um their interest in you are they like approaching you like do you have to have very clear boundaries you know from that facilitator participant perspective definitely yeah you need to be really clear with your energy like other you know women are deeply intuitive and they can they don't so it's like to operate what i felt anyway to like operate in those environments you need to like have integrity with yourself and, and it just like unfolds you know it is 
a requirement like you kind of feel inside like, i don't know about you but now i'm just like if something doesn't feel right anymore i'm just like oh that i just don't like how that feels so i'll make this decision now mm. you know it's like the way that we carry ourselves as we evolve um has more intention mm -hmm. yeah 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 I feel it's not like so much yeah sorry no you go ahead i was just gonna say like more or less what i felt is like not a pet like being up the front is kind of like there's like a, a pedestaling like a assumption that you like know all the things and it's like sometimes yeah but we'll you know it was like that's what i felt more so than like um like i don't get thrown people to people throw themselves at me like it's more like people just trust me and assume that i know what i'm up to mm. without really knowing me and like i am really nice don't get me wrong it's just like oh that's been quite interesting yeah the assumptions and like mm. yeah like you say the pedestaling um what was I gonna, oh that's right at the very beginning you talked about how we're energetic beings and yeah what I just heard you say there is that you know as a man you'd be really aware of your energy what your energy is doing do you think sometimes mm -hmm. that some people some men I guess some women as well just don't have that conscious awareness of how energy itself might be leaking like they're literally unaware of what's happening energetically definitely yeah yeah, it's like it's like anything. It's a it's an attunement that we can. It's like a subtlety that you feel, and you get more and more in touch with it. The more that you put your awareness to it, yeah, you know. But I can just, you know, it's a question of evolvement, or is it just getting older? Is it getting wiser? It's kind of just like, is it because your relationship with your body is more that you? A bit more aware of your actions and decisions and mm. Mm, mm. so this year you're probably one of the few people in the country that did more transformational festivals than <laughs> I did because <laughs> I ended up doing nine how many transformational festivals did you do or how many festivals I went, I went to 11 festivals oh, wow <laughs> which okay. was like more festivals than like the rest of my life like you know it was like doubled my festivals in my life in like <laughs> eight, eight weeks <laughs> <laughs> and how many of those were you DJing at or presenting at nine wow yeah, yeah. sometimes okay. twice yeah yeah so I I'm really curious. Do you feel like you shifted or changed? Like, did, were you going into the transformational container? Like, I kind of underestimated myself. You know, I was like, yeah, I've done so many. Like, what's there left to shift or change? But I came out the other side and went, oh my God, I'm not the same person. So, you did 11. Yeah. Did, did mm. shit move for you? Are you the same person? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Like, if, every experience offers its own thing. Like, this summer has been really about like my relationship to myself and because you know i'm like show up on this like stage and everyone's this just like ah, party and then it's like okay now i'm gonna do this and it's like super wholesome kind of like gonna heal people and like change the world for the better and then it's like and i want to go to this thing and it's like i don't even have time to I don't even have time to digest the experiences enough because it's like next one, it was like, whoa, there was so much going on. Um, so in itself, there were like lessons that I was learning about myself, how to manage my own energy and time and like, what do I need before I hold space or what do I need here or how can I help in this, you know, situation? Mm. And then yeah, it he kind of... I was just going to say, and then you kind of see people like yourself, like we had our own kind of like side stories that occur and you're just like, whoa, can, like, are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? And I'm like, yeah, this is fucking crazy. And we're just like, whoa, this is a game. And then, <laughs> and then it's like, next minute, it's like a beautiful 
life-changing experience for someone that just kind of was like oh there are other people like me cool you know there's like and you know so there's just so many aspects of it but there was a moment where I was like I'm just like sick of my music I just don't want to play music anymore (laughs) (laughs) was that like festival number nine or something (laughs) yeah oh it was just like the summer was crazy because like day the second festival and poor poor people like, revive festival it was such a good vibe like you were there right it was just yeah. like rain and and just like but people just because it was like so early in the year people were just like into it like loving it and then as festival season continued it's just like mother nature's like no i told you guys i'm not happy fucking bold fucking bold so it was like you know for some people make a living by having stores so they go to all the festivals and it's like they it was like hard work for like yeah. event organ earlier this year for sure um so like that's a lens that i never had before uh you know for me before that it was like oh well this is like a community of people here and like getting involved and you know getting into the the thick of it and now it's like well there's actually like yeah so many things going on (laughs) yeah yeah because you're right it is people's livelihoods and when you go from festival to festival to festival um and those people are so important in terms of the way they hold the space and the vibe they bring and the continuity and the energy that they bring um and yeah the weather just oh my god by the time there was like rain at shiva shakti i was i was just like oh you know like come on it takes a lot to do a festival in the rain it's part of the fun and it's epic a revive you know but there's also, it's like, man, when it kept going, it was quite full on. It was a full on summer of rain. <laughs> yeah, super fun though. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was freaking amazing. Um, highlight. Yeah. yeah, What what's your number one highlight from all the festivals that you did? The, the moment where you kind of went, oh, I can't believe this is happening or this is a life, I've just kicked a bucket goal here or, you know. No, nah, the, the, the problem is it's like too many. It's like, so now now I just kind of, a favorite moment would not be a moment. It's like a thing that I do, which is like, sometimes it's just like too good to be true. And I'll just be like laughing and I'll just be like, oh, this is ridiculous. Like whatever's, whatever fiasco is unfolding, it's like, I'm just like, this is crack up, you know, <laughs> like that's what I love. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some, there's so many moments like that. You're right. Uh, um, but I loved what, it when you were on stage with me. That was ah, cool. The, <laughs> in, the, in Dead's crew itself, when you had the the pop up go go dancing crew. <laughs> yeah, you guys absolutely killed it on stage. Eh? So many people thought you were professionals. I was like, this yeah. Real yeah. Oh. We're a professional, except we don't get paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to work on that. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It, you know, it was super amazing to have the six of us. I think it was six of us that, that traded off on the four different spots. It was, mm-hmm. yeah, an epic arising that happened spontaneously, literally. Um, yeah, that's what that I want to ask. A... Go, there you go first. Uh, I was just going to say, like, for example, that moment was, like, really pivotal, pivotal for me, not just because of, the, like, the stage and all the things. It was, like, at that festival there was like a moment I was like quite tired and I was like oh I don't have enough energy to go on that stage at like 11 p.m or whenever it was and like because that was like the you know that everyone's like had fun all night they're like whoa they're like ready to party and have fun and I'm like whoa I'm so tired <laughs> and so there was like a time part, part there where I was like oh I'm so like not I can't like Oh, how am I going to do it? And then all of the crew, including you, was just like, yo, let's do this. And you guys, like, supported me, came up on the stage so I could, like, feel your energy. And I was able to, like, drop into second gear. So that was, like, really beautiful for me as an experience, not to mention, like, that it was actually, like, we were on that huge stage and it was, like, we were just like, whoa! And I'm, like, DJing and I'm like, this is fucking crazy laughing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah yeah that's a really good point like I, I think that is one of the benefits or the gifts of transformational festivals is that we're there to support each other and to hold each other and to care for each other and so because I do remember you saying 
you're literally like, oh my God, I'm not on till midnight and I'm so tired and it's such a big stage. And I think that's part of why we just went, let's do it with you. Let, you know, let's, yeah. And there's the the space or the container where you can do that at a transformational festival. You know, there's, there's less rules yeah. you could say. Oh, exactly. And that's like the community that we're there for. It's kind of like we all have each other's backs because we all want the same thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, and that's what I was going to ask. Like, what do you think are the gifts of a transformational festival? What do you think it's bringing into the world? So by transformational, it's like particularly, are we talking about festivals that have like music and workshops and other things like that? Like they've got quite an array of things that you can do. Yeah, so they're not yeah. just entertaining people. They're also providing whatever's needed so that people can transform in essence and looking mm -hmm. at transforming society. You know, there'll be stuff on permaculture or regeneration or living systems or, yeah. Yeah, no, cool. That's good. It's nice just to clarify. Um, yeah, I think people just come out of those festivals with a new lens on life. It doesn't mean like I find that people will choose what they like and, and dislike, but what it does give is for me and the way I would explain it is like it opens up your reality to a different frequency so that you know it exists and then you leave it and you come back to your own frequency or previous or whatever and you are like, oh, there is a gap here that I... Mm -hmm no exists i'm going to try and integrate that now mm. yeah i think people find that challenging too right the integration when the gap can be quite big between that you know like you say the frequency that they experience at the festival and then coming back into their day-to-day -day life um mm. how do how did you how do you integrate like how big's the gap between where you're at in a festival and what your life is like now and has it narrowed over time yeah, definitely. It's like, I would explain it as like my relationship with the present moment. So like before I was very like, you got to do this, you got to like, uh, like running around, trying to hustle, doing everything and doing all the things, like using up all my time. And so the more that I kind of like through these embodiment practices on like, ecstatic dance and things like that it was kind of like if you make space to like be in the present moment you have a different way of walking through moments and mm. i guess yes yeah, just to clarify like because i said earlier i was at the frequency that you're on it's kind of like that's how i that's the what i would say some people might you know might be like what's your wavelength or the way that you just like when there's no one else around and you're just in your own space it's kind of like you're your natural way of being mm -hmm. so that like what i find is the more i slow down the the more i expand like things just like occur i don't have to like push too hard um yeah. but but uh, yeah i've just i've been in my van and um traveling doing music i'm very fortunate because i'm quite you know i've got like things just always unfold for me and I come from a privileged background so it's kind of like I can take risks and have dependent children and you know mm. uh, yeah mm. yeah I I know what you say in terms of like I find when I'm at a festival I really feel that slowness like the, and the more I feel like I can slow down the more I feel like I can feel the current of life and like you say the more that things just seem to happen there's less like pushing mm. or striving or trying to do stuff um yeah so for people that go to transformational festivals or even like in the ecstatic dance trainings etc what mm. kind of things do you suggest for the integration process like do you have things you do to support your integration when you come out of a container like that definitely like and the the integration is is like particularly after the training we've just done which is you know like substantially amount in time and what occurs it's kind of like the integration isn't don't go straight back to your job like 
you know, it doesn't make sense to you come back and you feel like an alien almost. You're just like, whoa, what the fuck is this? And so it's like you take time for yourself, get out in nature, like all the cliches that you people were just like, oh, oh but they, they actually work. It's like put your feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> take a deep breath focus on your back body like <laughs> yeah ah oh, totally how's your back body feeling right now yeah yeah tune into the trees oh mm. so here you are now co-facilitating ecstatic and body dance djing you're off to <coughs> europe you're about to do your first tour of europe you could say <laughs> yeah what gigs you got like right just uh uh-huh. what gigs you got lined up for this uh, european tour um so i'm doing a dance in london at the end of this month and then i'm going to amsterdam uh that's just to see family it's like part of my heritage is dutch which i just like know nothing about so i'm gonna have a have a look see uh and then the, the the main reason that i'm going over there other than like the to get to know the community as I'm holding the dance training in Portugal with Sasha again, the level yeah. one. Yeah. Awesome. Which and is... are you are you going to any festivals while you're in Europe? Yeah, there's one festival that I'm going to next month called Boom Festival, uh, which is, well, I'm assuming like a huge festival <laughs> with like yeah multiple different zones, workshops, amazing events. Like it's in a, it's in a town that is like always the festival. So it's not like a town that converts and say that's the town's festival. Mm-hmm. So I don't even think I've been around a hundred thousand people once before. A <laughs> hundred thousand people at the festival. I think, I think I got that right. It might be less, but. Well, I think um, Burning Man's 70,000. So. Yeah. That's feasible. Yeah. And this Holy. is like Portugal's biggest one. I think. Right. I yeah, can't so wait to hear your report back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so what are your ambitions then as a DJ? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do with your DJing? It's mm. a big question. Because um, you rock it. Like when you show up on the festival, like you, the dance floor is just heaving. Aww, you know? And, and so you've kind. developed. You. Well, it's true. It's true. Like I've done a lot of your dances. And um like a lot of your DJ sets and you have a crew like of people that just it's not like they follow you around but <laughs> yeah, but they're yeah. there you know they're, they're stoked and they're excited and they're there to support you and they just get up straight away um you know yeah. you definitely inspire that kind of enthusiasm from people so I'm guess I'm curious about what sh- what's your intentions as a DJ yeah oh, thank you it's so nice to hear um I just to speak to that, I, I think like I'm just like a learner DJ, yeah, really. But I think I think what people enjoy about my sets is like they know that I like dancing and I'm not like afraid to dance. And so there's like an automatic permission slip when you come to my dance floor that you can just like like you don't does no one gives a fuck what you look like. And so it's like really fun <laughs> and it doesn't really seem to matter what genre of music I play. Although I try to like, you know, match the the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard you play a lot of different genres. I definitely have some that I prefer over others, but that responsiveness, right. To the crowd, to the setting, to what's happening. Even that is, you don't always find that in some DJs. They'll just play what they play regardless. So to be responsive to what's unfolding from my perspective puts you in a different league as a DJ, you know. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but my plan, so to answer your question, my plan is currently like, like just just opening the music production box, which is like, just like I just had a peek through and it's just like, whoa, there is a lot to learn. And so part of me is like, yeah, yeah, like I actually enjoy learning like if I um you know it would be pretty fun to just like continually go to university like your whole life and just continue like learning heaps of things if you like didn't have to worry about money and all that bullshit it's like um so music production would be like next so that I can create my own sound so that my journeys can be even more specific because I like yeah I I like taking people on a dance journey through sound 
and DJing is a byproduct of that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, like, because I'm a dancer, you know, there are certain DJs, there's a difference between a DJ that just plays cool shit, which sounds awesome, but also then there's DJs that take you on a specific journey, and it's like Mm. they are sensing into the dance journey, per se. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of I mean, don't get me wrong, like, it's fun when you're up the front and people were like loving it and they're like, yeah, and you can be like, whoa, that's me. But like, I like it the best when people don't even know I'm there because it's just like they're just in their dance. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. So are there festivals or events or gigs or venues or people that you would just froth to play at or alongside, like, you mean uh, internationally or in just in general? Just in general, but definitely internationally oh. as well. I mean, I just did that, which was really cool. Um, there's a couple of amazing music producers coming up through New Zealand in the bass scene, and I just opened for them, which was a dream in itself because I'm just like, whoa, they are like 10 years ahead of me because um, I love both of their music. Um so that was cool. But then the week before I was in that somatic dance container, which I would consider like it's like light, it's like a, a super healing and just a just a completely different experience. I really love that too. So I like I love the diversity, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. of of being able to do what I love in in, in the, so many different ways. Mm. Mm. yeah that's true because I was at that gig um and you know it's a general venue with lots of booze and alcohol and all that goes along with it so the vibe and feel of being in embodied ecstatic dance training which you know yoga based (laughs) and then coming to a venue like that which is like full party and loads of booze what do you notice energetically like is it hard for you to deal with that or are you just totally down with it or uh, it makes it quite exhausting um, to be like in, in the mosh pit part, <laughs> like in down and like where the, where the most of it is, particularly because of just the level of awareness, I would say it's kind of just like, I just get annoyed when people like just bump into me and just like, bum, 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 like and I'm just like, I'm just trying to dance here. Um, <laughs> and it's like, well, just don't go up the front then, you know, it's like go to the back. So like actually that, I had the mo- that gig, we went upstairs and we were just dancing at the back and had our own space and it was like awesome. But um, that would be the biggest thing that I see. But like that that gig was particularly good vibes, eh? Yeah, it was. It was, it was indeed. I reckon it was because of the organisers and, and then the large amount of the crew that we had there <laughs> coming from the, <laughs> from, you know, from the conscious festival scene in essence. Yeah. Um, can you feel the difference if you're DJing at the front, if you're DJing to like, say a full sober conscious audience, or if you're DJing to, you know, a drinking crowd, that's not so conscious. Does it feel different? Yeah, I definitely like, it's quite, quite palpable. Like I, when I, in the stance training, we, I refer to it as the nervous system of the room because everyone is connected and everyone is vibrating and creating a field and you can sense that field as the dj and control it as well Mm. let's talk about that sensing the field (laughs) and controlling it how would you describe it for people Mm. that might not be aware of the field as such Mm. yeah it's if you consider the philosophy again that we are like an energetic being the like projection that we are creating within us dictates the frequency that we emanate at Mm -hmm. right and so like collective people will collect with a like frequency and so you'll see like a whole bunch of people over there and they're like dancing to one part of the song and then these people over here are like on this frequency up here and then you can see people that are like meshed and kind of like stands out but like i all like i could speak to a ecstatic dance in particular like sometimes mm. i dj ecstatic dancers for 
like a crowd that is like a higher percentage of people doing it for the first time there is kind of like a I don't want to call it nervousness or there's like a there's like a feeling I'm just like oh I can feel that feeling and then as the like experience unfolds that all that energy just like goes away and then at the end everyone's just like whoa I feel amazing that was so good and like no one wants to go home (laughs) yeah 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 I do feel like this is the next level of humanity's um it's not a perception of reality it's a recognition of the way that we can we can so feel the feel we can feel where each other is at etc and it's and it is so palpable and literally learning how to sense it learning how to influence it learning how to digest it learning how to not be influenced by it and I think Mm. we we kind of um what's the word we we move around this obliquely to a degree with yoga and with ecstatic and body dance but my feeling is it's going to become more explicit over the next decade or so the way that the field just impacts everything and we can impact the field consciously work with it in a very intentional way like you said Mm. yeah yeah it's pretty interesting what we can perceive that is occurring like yeah even on sunday you and i were like affecting the environment through thought it was like quite a bizarre experience yeah there were some cool exper- experiments to run right to see <laughs> like what yeah, is yeah. possible in a space like this and what can happen in a space like this um okay I feel like I want you to name like some some like goals or or, or intentions in terms of where you want to play I, I want to put it out there into the ether like do you want to play oh, Burning Man oh, yeah. do you want to play like what would just be because you oh, talked about yeah. what you what you have done and how it's amazing and awesome but you, it feels like you're just edging around not just saying the, <laughs> this festival or this gig or you know <laughs> yeah I would say it'd be like Burning Man I want to do an ecstatic dance at Coachella and at Tomorrowland like just bring that to a different a whole bunch of different people mm-hmm. and the yeah um is Coachella a, a transformational festival or is it more no, entertain it's more entertainment entertainment one yeah so, so like, this is like, bridging the gap right this is bridging yeah 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 taking like a like the medicine to the different crew and seeing what happens um but yeah I have a vision like because we I'm part of a joint vision to get like a billion people in the world dancing at the same time with the same intention to see the effect of that is on the collective consciousness and so I kind of feel like there'll be a moment where I'm like in charge of like a hundred thousand of them or something making sure that we're like pumping the grid hard okay so (laughs) let's take a moment to feel this right what is it eight billion people on the planet right now Okay, so we're talking one in eight people. Yeah, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, and thinking time zones as well, you know, like, okay, so a billion people, I'm just feeling into it, you feel into it as well, a billion people on the planet, all dancing. With the, the same, same intention. intention. <laughs> Whoa. See, that's working with the field. Mm. right because then that would just disseminate into the field and if everything arises from the field whoa you heard it here folks first one billion (laughs) people dancing globally with the same intention yeah Yeah, it it feels like a good place to to close (laughs) (laughs) blaze thank you so much thank you for what you bring in the world for the dance and the djing and the epic clothing um i love being at festivals <laughs> with you love dancing to you and here's to coachella in tomorrowland i will be your uh, go-go dancing crew master if you like i love that yeah how would you talk thank you <laughs> i love that one billion people around the globe dancing to the same intention oh, 
It's one of the reasons I've got so into transformational festivals and this particular crew, I have to say, that I've been rolling with that Blaze is a part of because there's such a vibrancy in the energy of the people and such a sense that we are creators and it is all about your vibe and it's totally okay to go into the darkness like what Blaze talked about. I love what he said, you know, here he is doing this ecstatic embodied dance training or embodied ecstatic dance training and he's one of three men out of 20 people, you know, and then he he goes in and he's like, oh, I'm feeling all of these things. Um, yeah, it's just so awesome. There's more, this is what I'm noticing, there's more and more men that are feeling supported and comfortable about navigating their emotional landscapes. Um, mm, okay, I think that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching again. And as always, please do share, like, follow, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and get the word out there. Uh, and if you do love Blazer's clothing, like he does way more than just those epic fur coats, et cetera, um, reach out to him. I'll have all his details down below. You can find him on Instagram. Uh, he is off to Europe, but then when he gets back, he will be taking more commissions and he does amazing work. All righty. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com, that's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter.